Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another one of our beginners webinars. So many of you will recognize me. My name is Nikki Kimball. I'm one of the educational consultants at Just Too Easy. I am the one that does the majority of the webinar training. Um, and today we're going to be looking at our advanced webinar. So this is the third in our series of beginners webinars. So as always, a bit of session housekeeping. We are scheduled to finish at 4.30, so it is an hour session. Of course, if you need to go earlier at any point, just feel free to head off. If you do have any questions as we go along, I have got Sophie in the background, who is our um, office manager and can answer any question. I ask Sophie questions about Just Too Easy, so she can answer anything that you've got to throw at her. So just pop those in the chat and she will answer anything that you've got to ask. I will also be offering you an opportunity to um, ask questions at the end of the training. So if you want me to put, put me on the spot about anything, you're more than welcome to. The session is being recorded and will be made available through YouTube as always. Now, in terms of what we're gonna cover in today's session, we're just gonna have a little bit of a refresher about accessing Just Too Easy and how you can log in. We're also gonna have a refresher about what we've covered already in the previous two sessions. Then I'm going to show you some tools and activities that build on what we've done previously. So for those, we're going to look at adding tiles to your launch pad. It's a little lesser known um, feature that you can utilize with your students. We're going to look at JITMIX, which is an ebook creator. We're going to look at JIT Branch, which is all about branching databases. Great for your data handling. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of J2 code and all the tools that we have available through that. J2 PDF, so making existing worksheets interactive. And then we're going to show you J2 Webby for showcasing through your class blog site. And then at the very end, if I've got time, because as we always know, I do run short on time with too much content. Um, I'm hopefully going to have time to show you how you can add and share your own resources in the resource library if you wanted to. And then Q&A session at the end. And of course, I'm going to signpost you where you can go for any further support. Now, a quick refresher. Hopefully, you should be familiar, seeing as this is the third in this series of beginners sessions. You can access us through j2e.com. And that can be done through any device, anywhere, as long as you've got an internet connection and a browser. So when you log in to j2e.com, this is the logging in page and you would use the usual method. So I know I've got a lot of um, Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish schools. So you all have your own button um, from j2e.com. So EA, that is for you C2K users. Hub, my Welsh users. And also for GLOW or the Scottish schools, you've got your RM Unify button. If you've got any Londoners out there, we've also got LGFL. And of course, we've got the manual school. So you just use the usual way of logging in. OK. And then just to refresh what we've covered already in our previous webinar. So in our session one, we looked at JIT to paint and write, j 5 sharing content with users, accessing pupil files, using the learning conversations for assessment for learning, spell blast. Easy access to your QR code logins and your resource library. So that was in the beginner session one. That was the introductory session. We did then look at um, in our session two, the teacher tools. So we looked at setting up teaching classes, J2 stars, J2 message, J2 homework and parent portal. So if any of you have missed either of those sessions, they can be found um, via our YouTube channel. So that is in YouTube and we are called Just Too Easy TV. So I think there's about 160 uh, videos on there. But of course, both those sessions are included in the webinars playlist. So you can have a look at those. They're available on demand. And of course, this one is going to be recorded. And I should have that loaded up there by probably the end of tonight, early tomorrow morning. OK. Right, let's get into it. So we're going to talk, first of all, about how we can create our own tiles. Now, this is really useful if maybe you've got a particular resource or a particular website that you want your students um, to view. Uh, I have lost many, many teaching hours 
trying to get children onto the right website that I want them to use because <laughs> they invariably add extra dots and extra hyphens and extra spaces and it just all goes catastrophically wrong. So this is a way that you can create a really easy to use link that your students can click off their launch pad and they can open up a website that's external to j2e.com. Okay, so I've got my website that I want to use. So this is a lovely game on BBC Bite Size, all to do with geography. So I want my students to have a look at this or to have a go at this as part of their activities for the day. So what I'm going to do is once I've logged into j2e.com, I'm on my launch pad and you'll notice I've got this plus button here. So I'm going to click that plus button and then I'm going to name my tile. So that could be the website name. It could be, you know, your it might be, I don't know, homework for 6th of November 2023. It might be, um, I don't know, geography, reading, whatever you want to call that particular tile. And you'll be given a preview of that tile here on the left hand side. So now what I need to do is I need a URL. So that's just a web address. OK, so I'm going to go to the website that I want to I want my students to have access to. And I'm going to click on it and I'm just going to right click and I'm going to copy that URL, so that web address. Then I'm going to go back to my tile and I'm going to paste that web address into that box there. Now, depending on which website this is, it may well pull um, a thumbnail image. So if it's YouTube, it generally pulls a YouTube logo. If it's Wikipedia, it pull the Wikipedia logo. Um, so it really depends on web what website you're using. And there, that's it. That's all you really have to do. You can, of course, add some detail into this info box. You can add tags if you wanted to. It's all a bit technical. You could add um, the age group. I don't personally tend to any, any of that. The only thing that I might consider doing is changing the colour of my tile. So if this is something that you like and you think you would use frequently, you might want to start using the colour coordination. You know, you might have um, yellow could be geography, red could be science, blue could be maths so that they can see which tiles are which. And then we press plus. And you can see that has added that onto my launch pad as a a link essentially is what it is. Now, as with everything in Just Too Easy, I've added that into my account. So if I want my students to be able to access that, I have to share it with them. So to do that on a tile, if you hover over the tile, can you see, I'm just going to zoom in here. We've got this little person button here. So I'm going to click that. And then I've got my share box. So this will be the same as within your um, My Files. We can use this drop down menu. And we've got the whole school if you wanted to. Uh, we've got our registration class, teaching classes if you've set them up, individual users. This might just be a resource that you want for one or two users or another teacher. And then you've got all classes in school. So I'm going to set that for my class. And there they, they have access to that now immediately. So just to show you, if I go to my student account. Now I've already logged in, so I'm going to have to refresh my page. But there you can see there is that BBC Bite Size. So my student can click on that and it's going to take her straight to that game that I want her to play. It's probably going to be a bit noisy. Um, but there we go. There is an interactive link and that will open up straight away and she can start having a go. She could read it, come back and use that information if she wanted to. Now, if you have shared it with your students and you want to remove that permission, all you do is click on that little person button again. And just click that X and that will remove that from your pupils launch pad. If you want to delete that tile completely, so you want to delete it from yours and your students um, launch pad. If you go to the I button and there's a bin there so we can delete that. So there you go. That is creating interactive tiles off the launch pad and sharing them with your students. Right, we're going to talk about JITMIX now. JITMIX is a brilliant tool. It's great for creating ebooks, and these are two contexts that you might want to consider. This one I actually looked at creating in our Maths Key Stage 1 webinar. Bit of a shameless plug, so you can have a look at that. Um, and this one is a recount, so this is a shapes fact file. So great for your maths curriculum. This one is a Gruffalo recount. So just to show you what a mixed document looks like. 
here we go. You have different page layouts. You can add content. So you can add any of the other seven tools. So we could add a write page, a paint page, a turtle page, a chart page, pictogram, animate or branch page. And I can turn the pages in my book. There we go. I've got a nice right page, a paint page, and I've also got an animation. So this is a recount of the Gruffalo uh, with my mouse and my fox retelling familiar lines in the story. So it will work with full interactivity of all any of the other tools that you've used already. OK, so that's just an idea for how you could use Mix. So it's great for creating ebooks. You can choose different page layouts. You can add JIT content. You can use the accessibility tools such as text to speech and word lists. You can save it and you can also open it as view only. So to show you how I did that, I'm going to open up Mix, which is here, this lovely yellow tile. And Mix, Mix, JIT will always open up in write initially the first time that you load it. Mix is this last tab along the right. It's the kind of grey page. OK, just to remind you that whenever you choose a different tool in the JIT toolkit, the page surround colour changes as well. Now, Mix is slightly different from the other tools in that it doesn't offer you a template to choose. It prompts you to choose a page layout or a play layout. It's a page layout. So you can see here I've got four different page layouts. So the first thing you need to do is choose a page layout. So you can click on any of these pages. I am going to stay with this one. And once you've done that, you can then choose a tool. So we've got seven tools in JIT. You can see at the moment it's a blue page. So that means it's a paint page. So as I use these arrows, these will change colour. So we have turtle, chart, pictogram, animate, branch, write. So when you have a paint page, you can only create paintings with the text underneath. If you were to create a chart page, you could only create a chart with text underneath. So you have to think carefully about which tool you want to use on that page. But because this is my front page, I'm going to go for a painting and I'm going to go for my text underneath. So when you've chosen both, you then hit tick and that will load that page. So what we can do is we can paint straight onto this page. So we have looked at paint already. So you've got the full functionality of paint. So we could use our texture tool. I can use my fill tool. I can use my clip art libraries, the same as we have done in paint. There we go. OK. Alternatively, instead of drawing straight onto it, if you've created something in paint, you can also click on this little load button here. I'm just going to zoom in so you can see. So if you or your students have created something in Paint, we can click on that load button and that's going to open up directly into your My Files. So this will load any Paint file that you've done. OK, so if you're looking for a chart file here, you won't find it because you have to have chosen chart in when you're choosing the page layout, if you remember. OK, so I can scroll through here. And I can see these are all my paintings. So I'm going to choose one of those. But just to also show you, you've all got access to shared files. So if someone shared a paint file with you, you'll find them here. And you've also got access to your pupil files. So this is a great way of creating pupil books. OK, so it could be, you know, you're collating um, the best pieces of work that the students have done that year. It could be that you want to collate all 30 pieces of work in one file. And you could do that here. So we can click on any of these paint files that my pupils have created. But I'm going to stick with my files. And I'm going to go for, uh, it's a bit late for Halloween now, isn't it? Let's go for, oh, let's just go for my woodland painting. There we go. So woodland animals. So I could be doing a woodland theme. So I can still paint on top of that if I wanted to. But when I click in this box at the bottom, that's my text box. So I can start uh, typing. So Woodland Animals by Miss Kimball. 
There we go. And you'll notice to the left hand side, I've got all my text tools that we would have in right. So these should be fairly familiar. I can change my text size, my font, my text color. You've also got your word lists. So we can click on that word list that will open up the word list for us. We can listen to any of these words. So I hover over them and I can use my speech bubble. Now. And that will say it back to me. Now, if you are using this on a touchscreen device like an iPad or a Surface Pro, it will work ever so slightly differently in that you click on that word once to hear it and twice to add it into your document. Whereas if you're using a, a laptop, you would click, you would hover over it and use the speech bubble to listen to it. But if I click on that word, it will add that into my document. So there we go. I've also got my text speech in the right hand corner. Woodland Animals by Miss Kimball. And that will tell me what the page says. Now, once I've done my first page, I can then add another page. So this time I might want to add in an animation that I've created and I don't want any text on that. So I choose my page layout and then I make sure that I, I choose a pink page because that is my animate page. And then I hit tick. So that now is going to let me create an animation. The other thing that you're probably wondering is how can I add in the background? If I click on that asterisk there, that will load that familiar template page where we can choose a background to start animating on if we wanted to. But again, I'm going to load a previously made animation. So I'm going to choose my load button here. And here we go. I've got some animations I can add in. So let's add in. Let's go for the Gruffalo again. So there's my Gruffalo. And that will, of course, play same as it would have done if I just created it in Animate and saved it. And I can add as many pages as I want. So maybe this time I want to add in a chart or a pictogram. Let's go for a pictogram with some text along the right hand side. Click tick. And of course, I can start adding in my pictogram. I can load a template using the asterisk or I can use the load button. And let's have a look at what have I got? Let's go for mini beasts. So there's my mini beast pictogram that I've created. And I can click in this text box and I can start analysing that data. So I could say we found more ants than snails, for example. OK, and of course I've got all the text functionality along the left hand side. And then I would save that. So I'd say woodland animals mix. I can hit save and that's going to save into my my files. Of course, if my pupils were doing that and they hit save. That would then um, I'd be able to access that through the pupil files area. Now, just to show you the view only mode. If I go to my files, so I find that mixed document again, if this is a pupil file, I would open up the pupil files area and find that mixed document. It, this works in exactly the same way. If I hover over it, I've got the green circle. If I click on that, I've got this option to open in view mode. So if I click that, there is my view mode for my mixed document. So I can use my arrows. I can hit play. So any interactivity will still work, any sound recordings and any bits of data. So there we go. That is mix. So we've looked at creating ebooks, choosing different page layouts, adding JIT content, uh, using accessibility tools, saving and opening as view only. We're going to stick with JIT for a second and we're going to look at branch. So our branching databases. So this is great for your maths curriculum. I know in the English curriculum it's year four. I think in the Northern Irish curriculum it is P5. And I'm not sure about the Scottish curriculum, I'm sorry. Uh, but I know in a lot of the curriculum it revisits it later, further up the school, generally through the science curriculum. OK, so these are two examples. We've got a very simple branching database. So this is just um, sorting mini beasts. My mind went completely blank then. I couldn't remember the word mini beasts. Uh, so this is sorting mini beasts. So very simple questions. 
this is a far more complex idea. This is a guess who game. So I would love, I keep saying this in every webinar that I showcase this to, I would love a school to do this with their students, for the students to take selfies and then to use questions to sort all the kids in class. So you could have lots and lots of bits of data here. And they use questions to sort all these people. So things like they've got curly hair, they've got brown eyes, um, have they got long hair, short hair, facial hair? <laughs> um, so that's just an idea for you. So I'm going to show you JIT branch. Again, found in JIT, opens up in right. Branch is this one. It's the sort of purple background. And the first thing it's going to ask you to do is to choose a template. Now, my personal preference is to have a blank template. I think that's my SEND teacher um, habits. I just like having a nice, simple, straight background. But you are more than welcome to choose a different background if you prefer. I'm going to choose blank. And then what you're going to do is you're going to choose the bits of data that you want to sort. First of all, just to highlight, you do have access to the clip art libraries here. Um, there is a simple mode and an advanced mode. So I'll show you the difference in a second. But what we're going to do is we're going to choose some data. So I'm going to choose animals. So when I click on that clip art library, it opens up into animals. So I'm going to drag the bits of data that I want to sort. So let's have a look. Um, and let's go for a sea creature. There we go. Now, if you add something by mistake, if you hover over it and just press bin, that will take that out of your branching database. Now, other things that you can add, that is in your clip art libraries. You've also got access to my files. So anything that you've added into my files. You've also got access to shared files, so anything that's been shared with you. Up here, you've also got a camera. So you could, that's how you would, um, if you were creating that guess who again that I was talking about earlier with your students, you could get them to take selfies or photos of each other. So you could use that. You've also got the search function. So if there's something that you can't find in the clip art, so for example, a dolphin, you can search for that. And it will bring up lots of pictures that you can use. And you can also add in words. I'm not sure why you'd use words, but you could. So there we go. I've got my four bits of data. Now, just to show you the difference between the simple mode and the advanced mode. The simple mode, it is just the picture on its own. Advanced, that allows you to change the titles, the name, and that will come up on the card and also to add a description. So this is a great way of building it into a research project. I'm thinking this is more like your year sixes, which is P7. Um, you could get them to research things like, I don't know, the weight of the animal, um, the lifespan, um, what they eat, where they live, favourite temperature, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and they could then use that information in the description as part of the questioning. So it's a great way of making that into more of a sort of project as opposed to a one-off lesson. But for the purpose of today, I'm going to keep it simple. So once you've got your data, you then click sort. And we're going to say, can I fly? That is my sorting question. So we're going to drag the data that it applies to on the left and the data that it doesn't apply to on the right. Now, if you drag it into the wrong box, there we go. It's very easy to start that again, hover over the data, use that recycle logo um, and then just drag it back into the box that it should be. You can also record yourself or you can get the children to record themselves saying that question. So that's a nice way of tying in some more digital skills. Um, and then we click OK and it's going to keep asking you the question. So uh, do I live in the sea? Yes. Nope and no. And click OK. And we say, do I live in the desert? Go oh, yes and no. And then we click OK. And there is our very simple branching database. 
Now you have the option to edit these questions. So maybe the question isn't written particularly well. Maybe you give some feedback to the students about their grammar or their maybe it needs to be a, a more in-depth question. They can use that little pen icon and they can re, um, rewrite that, that question. They can also re-record that question. And you can also do the same on the pictures. So then if we go to play, I'm going to choose this bird. No, let's go for the camel, for example. So can I fly? No. So we click on the thumbs down. Do I live in the sea? No. Nope. Do I live in the desert? Yes. And is that answer correct? Now, if they were thinking of something different, you could say, no, nope, that wasn't what I was thinking about. You can then add another item. So let's say yes. And that's going to take us back to that process. So now I have to think about something that lives in the desert. Um, what lives in the desert? Uh, um, koala? Nope. Right, for arguments, there we go, snake. We'll say okay. So then we have to have a question. So we could say, am I a reptile? And then we sort those questions again and click OK. And that's added another branch onto our tree. So then you save. So I say animals, questions, and we click save. And that will save into our My Files. And of course, that grays out as it always does with JIT. So that is branching databases. So that was creating a branching database, using questions to sort the data, playing your database adding additional data and saving. OK, so you can make that as simple or as complex as you want to. Right, we're going to have to spend a little bit of time looking at J2 code now. So this is a kind of a, a number of programs in a sort of a wraparound name. So within J2 code, we've got JIT Turtle. We've got Visual, which is very similar to Scratch, and we've also got Logo. So Logo is the one that I'm really going to focus on, but I'm going to give you just a quick overview of the other two. So JIT code is a tool or a tile, should I say, off our launch pad, and then you will have these different tiles that you can then link into. That's worth pointing out, we've also got Hive Hackers. So that is almost a complete scheme of work um, built around visual. Well worth a look. It gets incrementally more difficult and it is loaded into the resource library. So it has lots of resources, lots of lesson plans, lots of example activities that you can do with the students. So well worth a look. It is a company separate to ourselves, but they do run sessions on um, Hive Hackers and they're brilliant. We've also got examples that you can have a look at. So we've got lots of examples if you wanted to get students to have a look at them. And sometimes it's easy for them to look at a complete one and pick it apart, see how it's been done and then recreate their own. So they are there for you to have a look at. I'm going to have a look at JIT, JIT Turtle, very quickly. So again, this is part of JIT. Um, it's designed for the youngest learners. I would use this from reception, which is P1 and upwards great for that exploratory level where they're just kind of you know getting the handle of directional language and adding algorithms and manipulating that kind of code. We've got templates that they can use. Now these are actual games in themselves so we've got the Big Bad Wolf, Space, Desert Adventure um, and they get incrementally more difficult. So you would start with the wolf and then go on. So let's have a look at space for example. So I've got my rocket, my sprite preloaded um, and we've got six buttons that they can choose. They've got pen down, up, uh, forwards, pen up. I think that's the way around. Um, right, backwards and left. Now they have a simple mode and advanced mode. The difference is with the simple mode, the sprite will move with each click of the buttons. So for each algorithm that is programmed, it will move. For the advanced, it will stay in the starting position and they have to predict where it's going to end up. OK, so it's great for that skills progression. You would use that simple mode when they're first exploring it and then maybe revisit it in sort of, you know, year one or year two, which is your P2 or P3 um, and make it a little bit more difficult. So to show you, if we just move forwards and I'm going to go to this planet here 
When we hit a planet, it's got a lovely um, flag that appears. So here we go. Now you'll see my algorithm has built up here. So my, my code and I can manipulate that code. So I can move these around and see what kind of effect it has on the outcome. So if we press play now, that's going to end up in a completely different place. It's gone horribly wrong. Um, so there you go. Another idea that you could use is you could create this file and hit save, for example. So this is a bugged file. You know that it doesn't work. You could save this, share it with your students. So we can do that through our My Files using that green circle and click share. And you could get them to figure out where it's gone wrong and to correct that code. So that's a really nice activity to do with the students once they're familiar with, you know, coding and moving all these around. Um, so there you go. That is Jit Turtle. Well worth a look. Then we've got visual. This is very familiar, uh, familiar, very similar to Scratch. Um, so it's personal preference, which one you use. You could use a combination. This is just a tool in your toolkit of digital tools. How many times can I say tools in a sentence? <laughs> um, so this would be something that you could use that would just embellish other elements that you're using for coding. So by default, we've got our lovely little penguin. That is our sprite. And there's no coding at the moment. Now within Visual, there are three different levels. So to get to the different levels, if I just zoom in here, you've got this little drop down menu and that gives us our three different levels. So with the levels, again, similar to, to Scratch, um, you will just have less functionality. So less choice for the students to use um, and we can increase that. So level two is slightly more and level three has the most. So you've got things like procedures and variables in level three and sounds that you wouldn't have in the other two levels. Now, what you can do is you can, uh, you've got your sprite here, so we can change how our sprite looks. So to do that, we can click here and that will open up a clip art library. So we've got different costumes that we can add. We've got different characters. Um, we've got um, Halloween characters, dinosaurs, fairy tales. So, for example, let's get a princess going. And there we go. That has changed my character completely. You've also got the option at the top to add multiple characters and you can add backgrounds as well. So your background would just be adding an additional sprite. So you would change that in exactly the same way that we've just done. We'd click on that little sprite, we'd go to the little plus button. And if I scroll down to the bottom, there are some backgrounds. And let's find our castle. There we go. And I can click OK and that's added my character onto my castle. OK, you can rename these. So, for example, just to, to stop our students from getting confused, we could say background. Click OK, so now we can see that's the background. I can guarantee you will have at least one child that will code the background. So this makes it a little bit less likely that you get that student there will still always be one. I've done it many, many times. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how many times you tell them, don't code the background, there will always be one. Um, but that will reduce the likelihood of that happening. So I'm back on Sprite 1. You can see here's my Sprite. If I want to code, I click on the coding button. So this is the button for coding. If you want to get really technical, this is JS. So that stands for JavaScript, which is a programming language in itself. I mean, that's something that even I don't understand. So we'll gloss over that bit. Um, and then you've got your buttons here. So these are just worth having a look. If I was to teach this to my students. Um, and the way I used to teach coding was I used to set them a, a number of challenges. So, for example, the first challenge might be I want my character to move to the front door. OK, and then I might want her to move to the front door and say something in a speech bubble. Then I might want to add in another character and to have two, both of them saying something in a speech bubble and then coming up at the same sort of in one speech bubble and then one speech bubble going off and then the other speech bubble coming on. So incrementally more difficult challenges is how I used to teach it. So, for example, let's get her to move. So I'm going to go to events. 
I've got these sort of are when something happens. So for example, we use this when the speech space bar key is pressed. I want her to move, so that's a motion button. And you will have them uh, generally say move forward. Now the move forward button, it kind of jumps. So I'll give you a tip. There's actually a glide button as well. But this then requires understanding of X and Y axes. So it builds in nicely with your math curriculum. But if we say glide, let's go for glide over four seconds. And then to find the X and Y axes, if you see when I hover my cursor over the page, if I pop my cursor over where I want my sprite to end up, you'll notice underneath there is underneath my princess. I can't point out because I'm going to move my cursor. Um, there is an X and Y axis. So that is minus 65, minus 65. That's pretty impressive. So then we put that there. So minus 65 and minus 65. And then I will test my algorithm. To do that, we go to the play button and we've programmed it so when the space bar is pressed. So we need to press the space bar to test the algorithm. And there we go. She glides beautifully to the front door. And then you could build in some more. So let's press stop and she'll go back to the beginning. And then we're going to say a look button. So you want her to say after she's done that, let's just get her to say hello for argument's sake. You can click in that and change that text. So again, we're going to press play, space bar. She's going to glide and she's going to say hello. So there we go. So that is visual. So you can save that particular visual. So let's say princess would help if I could spell. And click save. That's going to save into my My Files as a bit of code. And then we're going to have a look at logo, which um, terrifies a lot of a lot of teachers. I'm not going to lie, but it's actually quite good when you get used to it. So again, it has three levels. So all of these have. Um, you know, more complex levels. Um, so it's great for differentiating with students. It's great for circling back year on, year out. So, you know, the students aren't doing exactly the same thing. They're building on previous skills from previous years. So you've got your level one, um, which looks quite similar to turtle. It's just um, not as childish. So you've got your forwards, right, backwards, left, uh, your home button, your erase button, your pen down, pen up and your different pen colours. Very simple. Then you've got level two. So with level two, you then build up the script. So this will create some logo language. So if we use forwards, right, forwards, right, forwards, forwards, right, forwards, right. Can anybody predict what shape that's going to be? It's a square. Um, so we press play and there we go. We've got our square. Brilliant. Um, and then we've got level three, which is the one that looks pretty terrifying, but actually is quite easy once you get head around it. Um, so we've got our forwards, backwards, left, right. OK, pen down, pen up, home, clear screen or clear canvas. Um, you can choose the pen colour. So if we use this drop down menu, we've got lots of different pen colours. And then you've got your repeat. So this is making our algorithm um, more efficient. OK, so. Again, the way that I would teach this, I used to start with teaching my students how to create polygons. And of course, the easiest polygon for that is going to be your square. And I can guarantee that is how they will start it. They will do forward, right, forward, right, forward, right, forward, right. Very inefficient. So that's when you can start building in your repeat button. So let's just delete this and I can click on my repeat. So anything in this square brackets will be repeated. So, of course, we wanted um, forward, right, repeated four times. So we have to add forwards, right, and then we can click play and see if that ends up with the same outcome. So I'm going to clear that screen. So I'm going to use the little button there. Have we got the same shape? Yes, we have. Brilliant. So then you can start setting them more challenges and it builds into your maths curriculum. So you might want to get them to create a pentagon. 
Now, I always give them a clue. You want your turtle to go 360 degrees because you want it to end up where it started. So to do that, to figure out what this angle needs to be, if we have a think about how many sides and how many corners does a pentagon have? And of course, it's five. So that is five. So if it needs to go back to the start, we have to divide 360 by five, which is 75. Okay, so we're going to clear our canvas, press play, see if it's our uh, pentagon. And there we go. So, of course, then you could set the more challenges. How do I create a hexagon? How do I create a octagon or a decahedron? I don't know. Um, and for your really super challenging ones, you could get them to sort of create irregular polygons and shapes. OK, so that's a really easy way to do that initially. And then another activity that I love getting the students to do is a spirograph. Showing my age. I'm not entirely sure that spirograph is still a thing, but it was when I was little um, and I spent many days days and days of my childhood creating spirographs. Um, so this looks very complicated, but it's not really. So we've got clear screen at the top so that um, our turtle clears the screen before adding another shape. We've got pen up so that it doesn't draw. And then we've got repeat 25 times forward, left, and then set X, Y. So that is a procedure. So we can use this turtle. So we've got some really nice procedures here. Setting the colour, pen down, and then it repeats all of those times. OK. So you can have a play around with this. It's quite good fun. Um, and just set the kids off having a little play and a practice. There are other things. So you've got your maths. I mean, I don't understand half that stuff, so I'll just close that again. And your lists. I would say that's more key stage three, definitely. Um, but there we go. And that is logo programming language. So that is an actual programming language that is used. So that is J2 code. So let me just close some of these down. OK, so we're going to move forwards to J2 PDF. Now, this is a fantastic tool. It's built around J2E5, so it will look very similar because we have looked at J2E5 before. And what it does is it allows you to add existing worksheets as a background. Now, if you're anything like I was as a teacher, um, I had folders and folders and folders of um, photocopyable templates, which were PDFs that I would print out. The kids would have a go at those worksheets and then they'd stick them in a book. Job done. So this is the digital version of that. So it will save on your printing costs. It means you can always access these PDFs or these worksheets at any point. Um, and you can also embellish those worksheets. So you can add things like sounds, text, pictures. You could add in word lists if you wanted to for the students that need that extra support. Um, videos, you can embed YouTube videos onto it, all sorts. Um, you can then share those with your students um, and the students be able to edit it. So I'm going to show you how that's done. OK, so just to show you, I've got this winter crossword. So I'm going to open this and show you this is my PDF. So at the moment, it's pretty useless. You know, there's not much I can do with this. I can't click anywhere. I can't add any text. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up J2 PDF, which is here. And then I'm going to open up that folder. Let's just move this. So I've got my PDF here. This is on my um, computer or my hard drive. And I drag that onto that Dropbox there. And there we go. That has stitched that onto a J2E5 file now. And I can click anywhere on that page and I can start writing. So what I want to do is I want to add a little bit onto that worksheet to make it more clear for my students what I want them to do. So I'm going to add some audio instructions. So to do that, I'm going to go up here to this button here, which is our multimedia tool. And I'm going to go to record sound. 
Now you can make these instructions or this sound bite as long as you want. I'm just gonna make this very quick just to show you. So I'm gonna click that record button. Can you complete this winter crossword? Have a look at how many letters the word is and then add that into the crossword. And there we go, I'm gonna add that to the page. So I can click and that will layer that onto that page. When you've added an audio, you've also got some audio options. So we could have auto start. So as soon as they open that document, it plays. You've also got loop, so it just continuously plays. Not sure why you would have that, but it's an option. Um, and you can set the volume as well and you can name it. Now, you might have students that would struggle with this particular um, activity. So we can add a word list. So word lists are here. Um, and it will open up. I've already got a winter word list, but it's a very long word list. So it might be that you've got maybe a group of students that would really struggle with this activity. You might want to have the words um, in that crossword as a word list. So I'm going to open up. I'm going to click new and let's have um, crossword word list. There we go. And I'm going to add in the words I think are in this uh, sled, uh, winter, gloves, hat, um, what else did I have, scarf, there we go, okay, I'm sure there's more, but uh, we click save and that has added that into the bottom of my particular document. Now I can make that look bigger. So if I use this little spanner in the corner, I can make that word list bigger so it looks more prominent. Um, and if I hover over any of these words in this word list and use that uh, speech bubble, winter, it will say that word for me. Okay. Now for that word list that's added into my document, um, for my students to access it, I need to go to that little blue um, circle and I need to share the word list so I can share that if I use that drop down menu I could share that with my whole class if I wanted all of them to access it but the context that I have said is that I'm going to share this with my whole class as a document but I may, might just have two or three users in or two or three students in that class that need that word list at the bottom so I'm going to share that just with them so if I go to users I'm going to share that with Lottie that is added that and I'm going to share that with Harry, for example. So I've got my two students that I need that extra, that's that bit of extra support. And there we go. Um, other things that I can do, I can add in pictures if I wanted to. So let's look for a winter picture. Make it a little bit more festive so I can add that in. And I can lock images to the page or text. So to, I can click on that and I can click lock and now that can't be moved by my students. And there we go. There's my PDF worksheet. So then for my students to access that word sheet, that worksheet, I will save. That's a winter crossword. I think I might have used that. I don't want to overwrite that. So let's go for two. Oh, uh, let's go for 22. There we go. So that I save that into my my files. So remember, if I want my students to access anything that I've created, I have to share it. So I can do that through my files. Um, but I've also got this button in J2E5 or J2PDF that allows me to then share that with my students. So let's share that. OK, so just to show you, this is Lottie. She's in my class. To access that worksheet that I've just set for her, she goes to the shared files area. She clicks list files and there is that winter crossword so she can have a go at that. If she goes to edit, there's that word list at the bottom. So she could have a look, right, um, a snowy season, number nine. Well, that is winter. So if I click winter, she can add that in there, hopefully make it a little bit bigger. Oh, so she might need to write each word, but she's got that as a reference. So she can click anywhere on that page, add it into the box. There we go. And she can delete that. And there we go. And she saves that. 
and her copy saves into her My Files. So just a little reminder to access our pupils content, we can go to pupil files. Lottie's in my class one. There's Lottie. And there's that winter crossword that she's just completed or just started, should I say. So there you go. So that is J2 PDF. I'm just going to close some of these. So that's adding existing worksheets, embellishing the worksheets with sounds, text, pictures or videos, sharing with the students and then accessing worksheets edited by pupils via the pupil files area. Now we're going to talk about J2 Webby quickly. This is a preset class blog, not to be confused with J2 Bloggy. They're very badly named. We are in the process of rebranding them, but we have been in the process of rebranding them for about a year now. So it will be renamed fairly soon. Um, so this offers you an opportunity to um, publish content that the students have created. Now, this is visible through the parent portal. So some schools like it, some schools don't. If you don't like it, just don't use Webby um, and nothing will be published onto your blog. It offers you an opportunity for students to have a wider audience for their writing and their content creation. Um, students can comment on each other's work and it acts as a digital, digital display board for your class. Now, before you get too worried, all content has to be reviewed by a teacher. So if a pupil pushes content to J2 Webby, a teacher has to authorise it first. OK, so I'm going to show you how this process works. And I'm going to do that through my student account. So I'm in Lottie. So, for example, let's choose something that she has created. So she's got this lovely write document that she's created. Here we go. So in every tool, there is this publish button. It's like a little globe. It's the Webby symbol. So she can push that. And because it's a pupil that's pushed it, it she'll be given that sort of warning sign that a teacher has to approve it. And it will just wait in a holding area until it's been approved. So if I go to my teacher account now, that file will stay in my moderate area. So you have a moderate tile, which is here. OK, and I can see I've got one. Well, I've got five pieces of work from class one that are waiting moderation. So if I open that up and it does it in a reverse order I think but there's that there's that piece of work that Lottie has pushed for con for publication I can preview that so that's going to show me what that looks like on um, my blog site so it's not published yet just gives me an idea of what it will look like and then if I like it I can press publish if I don't like it if it's not appropriate if it's unfinished um, maybe there's a pupil picture in there that you know that you can't have published. If you click bin, that just removes that submission. Doesn't remove the file, just that submission. If I hit publish, that now is on my blog site. So how do I access the blog site? That's done through J2 Webby, which is here. And then under blogs, there will be a blog per class. Now, these blogs are generated when a pupil pushes content. So if you are opening up Webby and you're thinking there's no classes there or my class isn't there, you just need to grab the nearest pupil's device um, and just get them to push publish on anything. And that will then auto generate that class. So you can see here in my list, class three and class six, they don't have a blog site because a pupil in class three or class six hasn't pushed any content. So if I go to class one, there we go. There is Lottie's piece of work, so piece of writing. And I can scroll through. So Pierre's pushed some content. Um, me as a teacher, I've pushed content. There's some test files. There's some um, animations and newspaper articles, all sorts. So it's a really nice way of creating that digital display board of best pieces of work for your students. As I said, this is visible by parents if you are using the parent portal. So it's worth having a think about how you are going to use this blog site. Um, just be mindful that all parents will be able to see all of the content on J2 Webby. OK, so that is J2 Webby. And finally, 
I'm just going to have a quick chat about adding resources in the library and then we'll have a look at questions if anybody's got any. So we have looked at the library in previous sessions. So this is full of teacher made content. It's off your launch pad. It will open up into the community. So this is where we're able to search for things. So, for example, we've added a huge amount of maths resources recently and you can open up these um, maths, uh, these resources. And if you like them, if you open them up, I don't know why that's showing us that. Let's go for one that's a bit nicer. This one, number one, um, you can like it, you can share it with your students or you can set it as homework. However, this is something that we haven't looked at is the My Resources area. Now, as a team, we create 99% of the content, um, but we are really encouraging teachers to have a think about publishing content that they're making with your students. So you can do that by clicking on this Add a Resource. Um, and there are some required bits of information. So obviously, you need to name your activity. You need to choose an age that doesn't just have to be one. You can choose multiple ages. You can choose multiple um, subjects as well. So, for example, maybe it's computing and it's art and design and it's a bit of English. So you can have multiple. You can choose a different language. So, you know, if you are one of our Irish schools or one of our Welsh schools, you could list that as a different language. And then instructions. These are instructions for the students that are completing the activity. So that is all required. And then you also need to attach a student attachment. So you can attach a photo, a video, a link to a website or a file. So this could be something. So, for example, that winter crossword that we've just created, we could set that as a as an activity. Then this is um, not required. So optional is the word I was thinking of. Um, you can add in teacher notes. So that could just be an explanation about maybe what you were thinking, um, explaining in a bit more depth. Maybe it's an extension activity. Maybe it's that it's printable. Maybe it's some um, usage explanation. And you can add teacher attachments. So if I'm adding teacher attachments, usually that's things like answer sheets or success criteria or a lesson plan, um, stuff like that. And then tags, you can add in tags. So that generally is things that you think another teacher would search for. So, you know, if this is part of maths, maybe it's um, number placement or fractions. So it's kind of a subsection within the curriculum that you're, you're working within. So things that people would search for. So that might be a crossword or it might be winter or it might be Christmas or it might be. Um, I don't know. You get the idea. <laughs> Um, and then you click save. Once you have clicked save, you then have to go into the document and then there will be a publish button within here. So you click that it has to be authorized by one of us. So we will check it, make sure that it is OK, and we will publish it to the resource library. Now, a caveat to that is please, please, please do not add resources from sites such as Twinkle. Um, and other subscription sites. Um, so it's mainly sites that have copyright um, restrictions. So anything that isn't copyright free, even if you cut off the copyright on the document, we will still know um, because obviously Twinkle, people pay for that. We um, could get done for sort of copyright infringement if you add that and it is published on our site. OK. So done all right this week. Um, just to remind you, there are lots and lots of different help videos on our YouTube channel. So this is our YouTube channel. I'm going to hit. Oh, it doesn't auto play anymore. That's great. Um, so this is our YouTube channel. There is the webinars playlist. So this will be added in. Um, there's the beginners webinar introductory and we've also got the teacher tools. So this will be added in later. We've also got our live lessons. Uh, there are four recorded now. We've got another one this month on the Titanic database. Great for your upper key stage two. So we do one a month. Tips and tricks. These are two minutes long and we've also got lots and lots of other videos. Um, so have a look at YouTube if you have any anything that you want to use. A little bit of information. Uh, you can email us at edteam at j2e.com. We're happy to answer any questions. 
Um, we're on Facebook, Just Too Easy, and we're also on X, formerly known as Twitter, Just Too Easy underscore com. And that is our YouTube handle. So I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I'm going to have a quick look and see if we've had any through the duration of the session. Let's have a look at the chat. And no. And there's a lot of you still there. That's good. <laughs> um, if you do want to type any questions in the chat, I'm more than happy to answer anything. Doesn't even have to be anything that we've gone through today. If you just want to know something before you head off, I'm more than happy to cover it. And of course, if not, if you want to head off, thank you so much for giving up your precious time. I hope you've enjoyed the training. Um, yes, you can add. So the question is, are you able to add more than one sheet to JTU PDF? You can add multi-page PDFs. Um, I'm trying to think, actually, Sophie might be able to answer. I think you can only add one PDF, but it can be a multi-page PDF. So just to give you an idea, I do have, um, you can also open anything that's already in your my file so let me have a look and see if i've got us there we go sats paper so this is obviously a very big pdf so if i click that and click add it takes a little longer but this now has multiple pages so i can flick the page you can see here i've got this multi-page tool here so that shows me all my pages i can delete pages out of that pdf so that one don't want the instructions you can click on that arrow and click delete and that's going to take that whole page away so it could be for this sats paper for example you just want them to do the first i don't know 10 pages you would have to delete each page that you don't want them to do but you could do that and then you would save that um i don't think you can you can't merge multiple pdfs though um i don't think so i hope that answers that question you're very welcome <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. OK, well, if we haven't got any other questions, thank you so much for attending. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, hope you've enjoyed it. As I said, this recording will be posted on YouTube, so please point any colleagues that you think might find this interesting, uh, point them in YouTube direction. Um, you can email us if you have any questions. I'm going to add our email into the chat. Please feel free to email us. Um, and we hope to see you for more sessions soon. There are lots more sessions. This is the last in the beginners series. So we will be redoing this um, series of three. But we are, we do have more sessions on the tool specific sessions for the intermediates and also the advanced ones that links it into the curriculum. That is all available at justtooeasy.com forward slash training. You so can you, merge multiple PDFs. There you go. I knew you'd come back and say something like that. <laughs> you just load them within J2E instead of going through the PDF uploader. You can add multiple PDFs to one document. There we go. OK, brilliant. So in J2 PDF, there is a load button. So you can load multiple PDFs to stitch them together to make one bigger file. So there we go. Even I've learned something new today. Thanks, so. <laughs> um, so, yes, join us for more training. You can book your places there at justtooeasy.com forward slash training. We hope to see you on more training soon. So I'm going to say thank you and good night.